Hey guys, so it's the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, we're all in quarantine, and it's raining outside, so I was like, I'm inside, might as well make another video. Uh, today I figured I'd talk about treatments, because that's probably what's on everyone's mind when they find out that they have Crohn's, you know, like, how do I get over this, what's the way to do it? So I figured I'd go through a few solutions, um, treatments, kind of like my last video, uh, some pluses, some minuses, and hopefully I can show you guys something new that maybe you didn't hear about, or at least you can consider some new options. So the first one that, you know, when you get Crohn's that everyone tells you about is Humira. Now Humira is an injection. It comes in two doses, 40 milligrams um, or 80 milligrams, uh, depending on, you know, how fast your metabolism is, uh, some other things. You have to take it every week or every two weeks. That's the um, time option. It's a TNF1 inhibitor, so it's kind of like an immune suppressor, and it's basically the most tested one. It's been around for about I think, 20 years now. Um, doctors, they're comfortable with it. Uh, it does have some side effects. Uh, sometimes, you know, like in the ads, they show like the last little part was like 50 different things. Um, of course, there's always a chance of that, but it's relatively low. But, you know, there's some side effects to keep, um, some, you know, keep in mind. So the, let's just go with the positives of Humira. Uh, it's been tested for a long time. There's a lot of data on it. Um, it's effective. I mean, it does basically what you need to do to fix Crohn's, and a lot of people have good success on it. I mean, when I found out Crohn's, my parents reached out to some people who we found out had Crohn's too, and they take an injection once a week, every two weeks, uh, based on you know, metabolism. I think I just said that. but And it works for them. I mean, that's good. But there's also a good amount of people who take it, and then after a while, maybe like a year or so, their body basically builds up a resistance to it, meaning it doesn't work anymore. So that's something to keep in mind too. That if it doesn't work, then you're not then you've kind of exhausted one option already. Uh, but now let's move into the negatives. I think that's kind of where it's going. Um, all the side effects, of course. But I mean, also that. I mean, you're on a medication for the rest of your life, essentially. It's expensive. It's up to $5,000 a dose, and depending on your insurance, it may or may not cover all of it, um, or even part of it. It's expensive, most of all. And, you know, of course, uh, the method of injection, I mean, the first injection, the doctor or the hospital will show you how to do it, but, I mean, after that, you're doing it on your own. That could be a plus, minus, not really sure, but it's just... It's something that you'll have to do for a very long time, and some people maybe don't want that. It's a bit of a lifestyle change. Uh, I mean, personally, I, I'm i currently scheduled to go on Humira within, like, the next month, so roughly April 2020, um, for anyone in the video later on. But as of now, I'm not on it, and I'll talk about that in a little bit when I get to some of the other solutions. I'm um, treatment, sorry. But overall, it is a trusted... It's a trusted... Uh, Trusted treatment. There's a lot of data. Most people do well on it. Um, only thing is you have to keep in side, in track. You have to keep in mind on the long time, the long term um, it, impact it might have on you, either side effects or you know having to take it twice a week for the rest of your life, and that it's expensive. But if but there's a good chance that for most people it does work. So that's kind of why it's been the most trusted for a long time. Now, the second um, kind of similar option is called Remicade. Now, Remicade is also a TNF1 inhibitor, so again, immune suppressor, but the method of delivering it to your body is a bit different, and the dosage is a bit different. Um, Remicade is usually injected into the bloodstream. Um, it's, I believe, I have it right here. Yeah, it's 5 milligrams per kilogram, so it's obviously weight-based, and it it's given in a little bit in a different way. So you're given your first inject injection, call it zero weeks, and then your second injection two weeks later, then six weeks later, and then roughly six to eight weeks again, and that's kind of how it proceeds. It's a little bit more long-term. Um, so that's a bit of a positive because compared to Humira, you don't have to take it as often. Um, of course, you do have to go to the hospital, for which is a bit of a downside because if you don't live near, you know, closer to, near, to a big hospital or, you know, place where you can get injections, it might be a bit of a hassle. Um, pricing wise, I'm not entirely sure about Remicade, but I'm pretty sure it's on par with Humira roughly. Um, but down to like the strict positive negatives, uh, it doesn't affect your lifestyle as much. I mean, 
you just take it and then you kind of go about your daily business. Um, it's slightly newer than Humira. It's still been around for a long time, but uh, what, what you'll notice is that certain hospitals have certain philosophies. So, for example, Mount Sinai, where I went for you know my to get diagnosed, essentially, uh, they basically have a very Humira-based approach. But if you go to like CHOPS, which is the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania in, um, I believe, Philly, in Philadelphia, they prefer Remicade. So it's just kind of based on where you are. And it kind of has the same thing. I mean, there are some long-term effects, and yet some most people are totally fine. Uh, there's a chance that it might work for a bit, and then your body will develop resistance. So then where do you go? Because Humira and Remicade are very similar. They both, they're both under the um, category of medicine known as biologics. So they are basically if you develop resistance to one, it's very likely that you'll develop resistance to another. So that's kind of the thing that if it doesn't work out, there's a very high chance that it might not work with Humira. So that's something to keep in mind. But overall, if that's if you don't want the um like the repetitive repetitiveness of Humira, Remicade is another good option. And especially if you live close to one, to a place that can do it for you, like the um injection and the into your bloodstream, then it's a great option. Moving on to our third kind of treatment, it's kind of within like the category of Humira and Remicade, but they're but it's kind of on a little lower scale. So there are a lot of biologics that are slightly weaker, and these these have, are more specific. For example, um, for if you have Crohn's in your um, large intestine or your colon, for example, there is a treatment. Um, if I'm not wrong, it's like amino silicic acid. It, I don't know the medical term for it. There's a there's a medicine. It's also a sort of like a biologic, but it's a lot lighter than you know Humira Remicade, and you you can take it as a pill. So it's very manageable, I suppose. You just take a pill in the morning, and that's kind of it, or you know a few pills maybe. Um, there's other ones like called Scalera. That's one of them. Um, there are ones for the small intestine also. And these are all kind of, I, I don't want to say a weaker version because they do work sort of in a similar way. They're all the same family of medicines, but they tend to be not as strong. So they have, you know, side effects are lower. People tend to um, be able to stay on them for a little bit longer. But the downside is that these are relatively newer medicines. Like 10 years ago, there was literally only Humira and Remicade. And now all these new um, medicines are coming in. But what you have to remember is, again, these are also, a bunch of them are biologics, and a bunch, so you might develop resistance to one, you develop resistance to a bunch of others, but, I mean, also that they might not be strong enough, so it really depends on you as a person, like, how your body reacts to it, um, how severe is your Crohn's, is it mild or moderate, or is it severe, is it chronic, I mean, it's really up to you, because, as you know, Crohn's is a very individual disease, so it kind of depends on that, um, one thing I would like to mention about these is that there is one out of all of them that is kind of can be used to treat Crohn's for roughly, you know, like mild, moderate Crohn's, and it can be done for a decently long time, and that's called Endocort. Now, Endocort is its um, generic term. The actual medical term is budesonide. Um, this is a topical steroid, and it basically, um, when you, it's a pill, you take you take a pill and it kind of it lowers the inflammation on the lining of your intestine. Now, um, for dosage, each pill is three milligrams. One, the doctor gives it to you. They start off with an original dosage of nine milligrams. That's three pills a day, uh, taking water in the morning. That's actually what the doctor gave me when I was first diagnosed. And what I can say from it is that it works. Like for my Crohn's, I believe they haven't classified it entirely, but it's more moderate. It's not. It's severe. It's not severe. It's um more centralized around my small intestine. I'm gonna make another video about this, but it's somewhat manageable. So for me, what on Endocort, uh, Endocort works very well. See, compared to all the other medicines I've mentioned before, it's not a biologic. It's it's a topical steroid, and it's not compared to like prednisone, which is a steroid that most of you are familiar with. It's much lighter. And the worry with steroid is that it's a hormone, right? Your body makes its own hormones like testosterone, testosterone, estrogen, so on and so forth, cortisol. But, you know, steroids sometimes interfere with that. And what 
endochord does that's different is it's not absorbed by the body you understand it's very minimal because it's not really going into your cells it's just fixing the very outer layer of your cells now that being said it's not curing your Crohn's by any means but what it is doing is it's kind of mitigating the inflammation which allows you to feel better and you know to some extent you know to help your intestine you know do its job and absorb nutrients um going to the exact uh pros and cons um First of all, a pro is it's much cheaper than some of the other options. Uh, you can get it at like a CVS or Walgreens, and you know even most insurance will probably be able to cover it. Uh, another plus is that you know you you can be on it for a very long time. Um, I've talked to a bunch of different doctors, and each of them says that if you know if it's working, you can stay on um, Endocord for six to twelve months. You know that's the general time frame, and if you're someone like me who's exploring other options, 6 to 12 months is a very good time. And over this period of time, obviously, you can taper. So for me, I started off on the doctor dose of, you know, 9 milligrams, 3 pills. And over the few over the last few months, I slowly tapered it down. So first to 2 pills. Um, stayed on that for about 2 to 3 weeks, then down to 1 pill. Now I'm on 1 pill. And it's, it is working very well. I mean, it... You know, it helps with the tiredness that comes with Crohn's because, you know, you're not absorbing everything. Um, definitely helps with pain, like intestinal cramping. That's something I had. And it, overall, it just makes you feel almost like more normal, like it used to be before you had Crohn's. Now, the only, the downsides with this is that there are some studies that show that over time, endocort may or may not, they're not entirely positive, affect your bone density. So, and that's true with any steroid Practically speaking, you don't want to stay on it for a long time, but it it can still because it can cause some damage. But that you know that research is still a bit shady. Uh, another downside is that again you do have to you know take a pill every single day in the morning. Um, if you miss one, it's not a big deal. But again, your body's not your body's going to get used to it, and also over time your body may just not respond to it anymore. And that happens with a lot of medicines over time. So that. Yeah, that's something that's natural, but the only thing is that it can lead you into like a false sense of security that oh I'm not feeling you know I don't have any more symptoms so oh I must be fine, and unfortunately I wish it was the case that that was you know that was is what happens but the Crohn's is still there it's just kind of being masked over, so even though I'm on one pill of Endocort now, uh, my inflammation markers and stuff like that those are still high because the Crohn's is still there, so. That's that's one that everyone should keep in mind. And if you're just diagnosed, or you know, if you're you know trying to buy some extra time, Endocort medical term budesonide is a great way to kind of extend your clock a little bit and allow you to explore options. So those were the three general um, medical term medical ones from like the Western medicine. And I'm gonna make another video about some alternative therapies that might be something that you guys haven't heard about. I figured I'd make a part two of this video so it doesn't get too long. Um, hope you enjoyed and hopefully this whole pandemic thing wipes, closes down pretty soon, right? Nice talking to you guys. See ya.